Well, we'll reconvene now. Todd, please. All right, so we're taking it away? Take it away. All right. I don't even know what number I am, but... Uh, Ten. Ten. Yep. That's my favorite number today. All right, so we're here to talk a little bit about soil erosion uh, and our survey results that we did. Um, so just kind of in summary, I don't think soil erosion concerns are, are new by any means, uh, but kind of becoming a little bit more uh, increasingly common. So last year, uh, sorry, we did two things last year to, to move towards reducing soil erosion concerns. One kind of more long term was the policy that you guys helped enact on one of your very first meetings, so thank you for that. Uh, and the other was uh, removing the topsoil that occurred, or sorry, that uh, impacted our infrastructure in 2021. So in early February, we seen some wind events, some strong wind events that uh, started that soil erosion ball rolling again. So during that event, we did a visual survey. We marked locations that needed some attention. We made contact with those landowners. Um, I'm happy to say that in many situations, uh, some reactive measures were put in place and uh, we we're able to see some uh, benefit that way. Now with, uh, with more wind and, and soil moving over the last month, uh, we ended up bringing in a seasonal employee to do a thorough survey of the whole county to mark our impacted locations. So basically we, we do the, the depth of the topsoil in the ditch, uh, how long of, uh, how long of, of the span that that topsoil is, is there and that kind of gives us an idea of how much of our local road in, uh, network is, has been impacted. So in, now that we have that information and I've included it for you here, I guess uh, a little bit more background. In 2021, we removed topsoil deposits from heavily impacted areas. Um, what we didn't anticipate last year was that some of our smaller deposits were going to then get some more put on them this year. And so now we're kind of seeing, you know, last year it might have been a one to two inch deposit. And now we've maybe put another one to two inch or two to four inch deposit in there. So we end up losing some of that road allowance infrastructure that we have been using. Uh, so you have the first draft of our, um, our, our survey as well as our cost estimates um, on, on what it would take to remove that. And I guess what I'm here for today is just to look for a little bit of direction on how we want to go about that. So in 2021, it was determined that the County of Newell would um, would take the lion's share of the uh, costs and the uh, the producers would not. And I guess we're, we're wondering if that would be what we want to do again, to remove that topsoil with county money and county um, resources, or, or if we want to lay that burden utilizing bylaw 2012-21, the unauthorized road use development. Okay, thanks, Todd. <clears throat> Any questions, Neil? Go ahead. How do you determine? Uh, you know, you have a big wind. The whole sky's dark. Whose field the dust came from? Before we decide who to charge. Yeah, and then that's uh, I think part of the conversation that we had last year as well. Uh, so we drive road networks. We don't drive in between everybody's fields. So the only time we know that soil was deposited is when it's in our road ditch, right? Um, and we've battled this internally as well. Well, how do we know it wasn't the west quarter that was blowing and landed on the east quarter's road allowance? Uh, so that being part of the conversation is how do we, how do we know whose uh, field was moving and, and deposited there? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. There's some that are very obvious, some, some less so obvious. Yeah. Holly, go ahead. Hi, Todd. So divisions nine and 10, first thing, aren't included on here. So I take it nine probably didn't have any, um, and, and uh, I'm wondering why 10 wasn't on, on my one anyway here. And then um, back to that, Though we don't know exactly where the dirt came from, when we're looking at um, orange and red, um, those heavy sections, we're, we're pretty sure um, what would be the cause of those filled road ditches, aren't we? Like where the dirt has come from? Um, yeah, to your first question, these are greater beats or operational divisions, not uh, electoral divisions. So 
Division 9 is in here, it's just not outlined as Division 9 and, and 10 as well, sorry. Um, and then secondly, yeah, on some of the very heavily impacted areas, we would absolutely know where that came from. Yeah. Okay, Dan, go ahead, please. What does that bylaw that you referenced, um, what does it recommend doing? How does it, how does it speak to this? Um, and I probably should have brought it today. I would have been thinking ahead, um, but I did not. Uh, so section three talks about um, what landowners or, or uh, ratepayers are allowed to do and not allowed to do in our county road allowance. Uh, and one of the things they're not allowed to do is deposit topsoil or um, another thing they're not allowed to you know, do development in our road allowance, um, put things in our road allowance that would uh, uh, deteriorate the, the infrastructure, I guess. is. Kind of the way that works. Uh, Dan, and then one uh, please. Further to that, would it be a surprise to any farmers if we were to charge this back? Well, no. Uh, so last year, and many of you probably got them because you own land, but we sent out three letters, um, uh, hand, we're not hand delivered, but through the mail. Uh, over the course of the year, you know, outlining what we were doing. Uh, we've had lots of great conversations uh, with producers about it. Um, I don't think anybody would be surprised if it was their responsibility to clean up the topsoil that came off their field into the road lines. Uh, Lynette and then Adina, please. So part of that bylaw though, is they're not allowed to take it back either. Like they can't do that work either. So, um, by saying that we are doing it, they you probably still have some problems with that of somebody wanting to do it themselves. I really enjoy handing off all of those concerns to Terry and Mark. It's like my favorite thing to do. And but yeah, I think uh, part of that bylaw does say that we don't want um, just anybody working within that road allowance. Uh, so the really great thing about our landowners is they're awesome. Um, but we want to make sure that our infrastructure is brought back to the same as it was before the event, before the soil erosion event. So we don't want to leave any extra, or sorry, we don't want to leave the opportunity for some extra digging because maybe a landowner wants water to run a different direction. Uh, you know, there's, there's all those little intricacies that, that we don't want. So uh, through an agreement, a landowner can do the work but they would have to use, uh, they'd have to get Mark's approval as well as they would have to use um, county approved kind of contractors, guys that we've used before that understand the, the ins and the outs. They would have to make sure they do a first call that all of the, the things 100% like we would have to do. So, which might be different for how, how some landowners do things. Good. Okay, thanks Adina, please. So I know you talk to uh, landowners and you ask them, is there something you can be doing to decrease this? Have you met any kind of resistance as far as I'm not changing the way things are going? So if it blows, it blows. Or are people pretty receptive to putting things in place so that it doesn't blow as much? Yeah, there's so many things that go into soil erosion. It just sounds so simple, but it truly isn't. Um, and I think to answer your question, about 99.5% of producers don't want their soil to blow. Um, they're also 99.5% of the producers that are willing to put proactive measures in place. Uh, maybe I should say 75% of producers because we had a bit of erosion. Uh, but 99% of guys are willing to do reactive measures once that phone call's made and we've you know, had some great conversations. So there's a very small percentage of producers that uh, are, are like you said, just like, well, it got windy, so what? Not, not, it's not the way it works. Good question though. Okay, thank you, Greg. Uh, what's the precedent on this? Have we done this before? And what did we do? Um, and um, I'm trying to rack my brain if, uh, this sounds like a liability issue. It sounds like it's something that may be covered by the, the farmer's liability insurance. Just thinking out loud. Yeah, just to uh, make that a little narrower for me, precedence in which part? 
the cleanup, uh, the cost of the cleanup going to the farmer or or paid by the county? I can only speak to the last 17 years. Um, and it, we've only done it once and the county cleaned it up and paid for it. And that was last year. And that was last year. So I think that that's a good question. And I think put some perspective on this for us. <clears throat> um, uh, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, so just to add a little more context after the uh, quarter of a million dollar price tag, that was, we ended up spending less than we thought, thought we would, but uh, Todd engaged with uh, producers. They drafted the soil erosion policy. We've all, always had the uh, unauthorized use of road allowance by law. Well, I shouldn't say always, but we've, we've had that by law in place for a number of years where we have that tool where we could bill the landowners. Last year, uh, the thought was it wouldn't be fair for the very first time to uh, bill it back. So they got a pass, county as a whole, paid to clean up that infrastructure. But the idea being there'd be an education component. So those three letters Todd's guys have sent out, there'd be a public engagement component in developing this uh, policy, which was producer uh, driven, right? A number of meetings with Todd and some uh, engaged producers there. So I think the intent moving forward was for the erosion to be the cost of cleaning cleaning that up to be the folks where the uh, soil came off the property or adjacent to where it was deposited, right? Uh, what percentage of, uh, of the circumstances this year were also a problem last year? Well, without, yeah, I, I could send you that very, very easily because we have both years that you can overlay on a map on our, uh, yeah. on our system. Um, I would say that last year was a pretty wide berth of uh, problem, I, I guess, erosion problems, kind of castles south to um, Scandia and, and right across through Rolling Hills and up to Tilly. Uh, where this year we kind of seen more, uh, at least um, more of the heavier erosion this year in the Tilly and Rolling Hills area, and, and less so in Scandia and Rainier as a whole. So there was a lot of uh, uh, reactive measures put down in uh, February in the Scandia Rainier area that really helped uh, as it came to this time of year. So it was management that reduced the breadth of the problem, basically. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dan, please. Those areas in orange and red, I would assume we probably saw a lot of the reactive measures taken there or did they not occur there? No, I'd say the matters, the, the, the areas that you see on your map that are orange or red would be the places that didn't have, uh, uh, or, or if they did put measures in place, they weren't effective. Um, this, this fall after irrigating was all done, we had wind and hot weather for, well, right up until just about Christmas time, right? So any moisture that was in that top area or top, you know, four or five inches of, of land was almost gone. So when we came down to talking to people in uh, February discussing options for how to put some reactive measures in place, there was, there was three kind of things that we heard people were going to do. They were going to go in there with their cultivator and try to bring up lumps. Well, that doesn't work if you don't have any moisture. So uh, a few of our producers tried that and it just, it wasn't effective because they couldn't bring up any lumps. Uh, the second one that was very common was applying manure. And, and that one, uh, at least in this year, seemed to be the most effective. And then the, the third one that uh, I only talked to one producer that was gonna try it, it was a small area in his field. Uh, he was gonna pin some straw. So yeah, anyways, orange and red would be the uh, areas where less stuff occurred or it just didn't work. Holly, please. What's your opinion on the yellow sections? So I guess uh, I have a lot of opinions, Holly, and we're probably might not be the best place. No, I'm just joking. Um, the yellow sections to me outline we have four to eight inches of dirt and four to eight inches of dirt is, is a lot. Um, the one thing that I didn't highlight very well is last year we had orange and red everywhere. 
right? These are the exact same uh, measurements that we used last year. This year we have a lot more green. So we're actually kind of getting better. We're just not outlining it very well. But uh, my, my opinion on the, uh, the orange is that we have to do some work there. We have to, yeah, or sorry, yellow. Yellow would be, uh, yeah, that's four to eight inches of dirt. That, that's a lot. Okay, does anyone have some direction for us? Uh, Greg and then Neil, please. Yeah, I think we should be charging the farmer directly for the costs of the soil erosion cleanup. Myself, that's how I feel. Now, one, one of the reasons why I feel that way is that I think this is a liability exposure on their liability insurance, uh, farm owners liability coverage uh, for property damage. We have property damage here, that's our, our road ditches, right? So I would think they could claim it back to their insurance companies. Usually a deductible for property damage is a thousand bucks deductible. So if they don't have liability insurance, they should have it. So I think this is something that we should charge them for. Okay, thanks, Greg. Uh, Neil, you had your hand up. And then yeah, Todd, uh, you said last year there was red all over, a totally different map. And I was just thinking maybe, uh, I think the farmers should pay for it, but I think you're going to have a, a really tough time isolating the farmers. So as would there be any merit into taking care of it in our egg mill rate and spreading it right across the county next year? <clears throat> Buck an acre to look after the roads? Because it, it's all over, it's every every district. And it can change, especially with the drier weather we're in. That would tend to be a disincentive for good management practices, which I think are as Todd has suggested certainly part of the solution here. Um, Holly, go ahead. A couple of things, Greg. So were you recommending option two? But the, 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 that, um, the stuff that I understand Todd has highlighted as a stuff that's basically red, yellow, orange that needs to be done and paid for by farm, I think it was option two. Is that what you're saying, Greg? Okay. Let me take a look. Okay. And the same way, if you look at all the maps, that the, um, the the dirt is mostly in the south. I don't think it's maybe fair for the farmers who um, have the imagined practices or more in the north who don't have the issues to to um, help subsidize those who haven't been doing quite so well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dan, go ahead. I, uh, I think it's kind of funny that we uh, were worried about getting them to pay for this and maybe increasing a mill rate for them when we just decided not to increase their mill rate um, because it's it's too hard on them. Um, saying that, I, I do think it's, it's their responsibility. Um, they should be paying for it. It sucks. Sandy soil blows, and there's not a whole lot you can do. You can put all the measurements you want in place. That sandy soil is going to blow. That one corner, that quarter right by Canagoa's potato barn is going to blow every year. It, hopefully, they can come up with something that works well for them. But uh, yeah, I, it sucks. But I think it's I think it's their responsibility, and I don't think we should be we should be covering it for them all the time. I think by charging them, it 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 does force them to. Uh, to, to take more measures to do do a better job of it, so that's that's where I'm at. I think we should be charging them back, clean up the heavily impacted areas like you suggest in option two. Craig, yeah, that's I'm in agreement. Option two. Thank you, Holly. Todd, earlier you mentioned that in some cases maybe it's not clear or maybe some dispute about how the dirt got there. Is there an appeal mechanism if someone really was unhappy? I suspect there'll be a few cases where we'll have to have some conversations with the different producers and 
and neighbors and figure some of that stuff out. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, did you have a comment? I saw you missed your hand there for a bit. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree. We've, we've put this policy in place for a reason and there are guidelines there to follow. Um, also, we did talk about this last meeting about um, the user pay system and uh, we all know that farmland comes way short of um, paying the Ag Service Board budget already. So um, I do think that this needs to be borne. Uh, I was in favor of it being borne last year by the um, area um, that it was deposited on or left the ground from. Um, but I'm even more in favor of that, that happening this year. Okay, thank you. Somebody prepared to make a motion? Dan? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, follow option number two, where we clean up the heavily impacted areas, utilize bylaw 2012-21, an authorized, unauthorized road use development, and charge the cost back to the adjacent landowner, leave less impacted areas to be cleaned up with regular, regular construction schedules. Okay, any further discussion? Ready for the question? Oh, God damn. And to add to that, how hard would it be to put a dispute mechanism in place on top of this? Sorry, put a what? A dispute mechanism in place in case someone says, this is not mine. <laughs> we'll set up a whole meeting in June for you guys. Okay. No, I think anybody is always welcome to come to this table and and raise their concerns and, and voice their opinions. And I don't know anybody that wouldn't appreciate hearing some of these opinions. Um, you'll probably hear them first, uh, being the counselors in your divisions that we're, we're gonna be doing this work. Um, I would like to say though, just so you know, it's not always just bad management practices that make these things occur. Sometimes it's just mother nature uh, doesn't give us what we need. And, and eventually you have to start preparing your land so if somebody went out and started preparing for seeding today and a 90 kilometer an hour wind comes on monday i mean it's really hard to be perfect all the time but i do i appreciate what you guys have done here today yeah i think this isn't this is a problem that can and does exist across the county i mean there's as much light soil in the north as there is in the south and uh it's it's uh it's an issue um Okay, ready for the question? All in favor, please indicate. Okay, that's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Great discussion. Yeah. Appreciate it. We've done a lot. Okay, we've got, uh, we're down to 11.4, our annual report for 2021. Matt, do you want to start that for us, please? Yeah, just uh, Cole's notes, uh, Ariana being away. Um, there were a few edits that were requested at last meeting. Those have been rolled in. I know we've got one additional edit from uh, Reeve Dirksen to roll in after this meeting, but the annual report is in front of council for a final review and sign off or additional edits i i do have one suggested additional edit ariana did or we, we have an edit that was raised at the last meeting that we express appreciation to our partners and i would uh, if you have a copy of the report on your screen you see what has been written and i don't have the copy right in front of me, but I have suggested, I'm mean, suggesting that we add collaboration with our municipal partners, nets increased benefits for residents of our region, and we enthusiastically thank the county's partners, dot, 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 picking up the rest of that sentence. What does it say there, Matt? Do you have it? Sorry, I'm not on, on the uh, site right now. Yeah. Yeah, enthusiastically thank the county's partners. 
uh, for their continued work towards keeping our region vibrant and sustainable. Are we comfortable with that as a response to last month's or two weeks ago presentation? Kelly, go ahead, please. I'm prepared to make a motion to approve the report as edited. Thank you, Kelly. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, we'll call the question all in favor of moving forward with the report as edited, please indicate. That also is carried. Thank you. We move on to our meeting with Grassland Schools, a call for agenda items. Matt, can you take us through this? Yeah, so our meeting's coming up uh, pretty quick. I mean, a few weeks goes by, by pretty quick. What we've got uh, on the agenda so far is agricultural education and cultural awareness. So Ariana's just been keeping this one on the agenda to uh, keep it top of mind and uh, invite if there's any other agenda items we'd like to add. Uh, thank you, Greg. Yeah, I'd like to um, just reiterate to Grasslands uh, support from us about the work that they do in the trades. Uh, they do put significant amount of um, effort into advancing the trades in our, in okay. our county. So yeah. that's one thing to, to put in there. Excellent. Thank you. Dan, please. Wouldn't mind talking to him about a possible creation of a, of a MAP school, a Mennonite alternative program, just to try to keep some of these uh, some of these kids in school and get on at least their grade nine, preferably their grade 12. Okay, thank you. Neil? Yeah, can you just elaborate a bit on that then? Like, I think that's a really good idea, but what do you think? It Create some kind of a program that, that semi caters to their needs. Um, the, the the low German speaking Mennonites they want to learn low German um, yeah we want to learn how to speak and read and write uh, low German there's a lot of other things that they value differently than than the regular public education system values um, and part of that is what keeps them out of school at an earlier age than they should be if we can uh, we can get them to create some kind of a program there are programs around there's a map program in Vauxhall. Bow Island has one. There are programs that are set up to cater to them to make sure that they stay in school and get a proper education. Otherwise, they're just leaving in at, at whatever age they feel like and enrolling in other programs that are uh, registered and it's not working. Yeah, I agree with that. Put that on. Okay, thank you. Kelly, you had your hand up. Yes. Um, I'm always interested in their projected numbers and they're usually very uh, open about those projected um, attendance enrollment. numbers. Enrollment, oh, thank right. you. Right, okay, thank you. And I assume that we'll forward a, a list of these to Grassland so they can come back to us with, with uh, information on what maybe is already happening in some of these areas. So that sounds good. Is there anything else? Lynette, please. Um, so I don't know how these meetings all work. Will Grasslands be coming to us with some agenda items too, that maybe things that they're going to want to talk to us about, and will we see that all before the meeting? I'm not sure how these all work either, but I'm assuming, you know, good uh, procedure, the agenda gets circulated in, in advance. So you, you should have a few days to chew on their items as well in advance of the meeting. If, okay. if, I might, if I might share with you, that's exactly what happens. They put their, agenda, their items out and uh, indicate them as their items and they put our items as our items. So somebody needs to be prepared to speak to them uh, as the agenda item comes up to start the conversation. And uh, then we answer their questions if we can, otherwise we get back to them. 
Okay, thanks, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Are there any other suggestions or can we move on? Seeing none, I think we'll, we'll move on to item 11.6, uh, counselor payment sheets for February and March. Uh, we need an, a motion to accept those or conversation around it. I'm not sure what the wish of council is. Holly, please. I actually have a question because I was going through this and um, for example, it, for, for myself, I think it was the March one, um, there was a, a meetings I've gone to and though I put it under a no charge line, like for example, it says chair EID meeting, it doesn't say that it's no charge and I put it under no charge and it should be no charge, but is there a way, is like, it's a compensation, we're just going to pick it up if, if the system makes a mistake? I had the same question, got it answered this morning. It tallies up in our sheets, but you won't get paid for it. So it, it tallies up under your hours worked, but not under the hours for compensation, which makes it quite cloudy and hard to deal with and makes me make a lot more notes than I should have, I guess, but it, I, I can understand the reason behind it. It's, it's an accountability thing. You put in 15 hours this week. People think you haven't done anything. Well, look, no, you can go look at the records. I've done 15 hours of service that I'm not getting paid for. That's where my $1,000 of, of, of pay is, is going. So. I can, I totally see the value of putting it in there, but it, it does kind of cloud it and make it look weird in here. So yeah, all the ones that are there, if you click on them, if it says no charge, you're not getting paid for those. So I'm not going to make any amendments to those, thankfully, because that was a lot of amendments to have to make. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or a motion to uh, accept the, the payment sheets? Uh, Holly, please. A motion to accept the counselor payment sheets. Okay, thank you. All in favor, please indicate. <laughs> That's carried, thank you. Requests for functions of council. Do we have any? Uh, Greg, please. Um, yeah, I have one here, and it has to do with the, the Silver Sage uh, board that uh, the, the Alberta uh, Egg, I can't remember, the, the acronym is AAAS, so I don't know what that means, but they've requested that uh, the town, City of Brooks and County, yeah, they, they've requested that a rep from our board sit um, and just be there as a as a mentor or uh, kind of a guide uh, through their uh, early um, early board meetings uh, to make sure that they're being done properly, proper governance is followed, make uh, maybe make some suggestions if they need. So I'd like to make that um, a function of council. I've I've been to two already, um, and there's another one here coming up in two weeks. So it is a, a, there is significant time. They're about two, two and a half hours each. So I like, I'm wondering if we could have that as a function of council. Okay, thank you, Neil. Do you need a motion for that? Uh, yeah, we need a motion on that, I think. I've, I've got another one okay. from uh, Joint Services and you've been to it already that they're actually working more than I thought they were, but they have that, uh, breakfast once a week yeah uh, would it be worth making that a function of council and just going around the table and everybody take a turn to show up just to show support it's once a week seven in the morning i'm definitely not going <laughs> i don't know it, well yeah that's that's a good question i was there once well that's just... right and it, it came up with joint services mitch has got it set up it's being well it, reasonably well attended yeah i uh, didn't go to the last one because i i just missed it but yeah. i just thought i don't know what do you think right we could spot somebody in there every week doesn't have to be the same person just yeah yeah i think it's important that we're represented there um whether it's the same person or different people if uh i think it'd be good to spread it around to show support from the mm -hmm. county um and i think I think it'll gain traction if if the city a city rep is there and a county rep is there um i think it it can gain some traction with 
uh, stakeholders in the area. So uh, I, I'm thinking so, Neil. Yeah, I expect it'll be well attended if, as long as the agenda is dynamic and attractive to people who want to come. So I, I'm fine with that. If what did you think? You're the only one that's been there. It was the first one after a number of years of, of delay, so there weren't. Uh, I, I was there at two hats, I guess. I mean, I'm a business person in the community, and that's kind of the hat I wore, and that's probably most of the comment. You know, I was involved in the discussion quite a bit. Uh, there was only five or six other business people there, but I think I think that probably has potential to grow. I don't know what's happened, but I think maybe it could be left as, you know, joint services could ensure somebody is there on a regular basis and that it circulate around the room uh, from time to time. Um, I, you know, I have to say, you know, I have personal interest in intending sometimes depending on what the what the subject matter might be, but that's separate from what we're talking about here completely. So I, I think it's it's a good idea to have representation there. Uh, Holly, please. Um, what what's the uh, what was the agenda when you were there? Like, is it speakers coming in? Is it just kind of a look? What's what's happening? Um, no, as I said, it was the first meeting after a long pause, and it was basically a discussion around the state of the union right now, and and what's happening uh, in terms of of workforce. Uh, um, uh, dynamic at the border and all kinds of things in terms of flows of flow of goods and services and also also a, a brief discussion there were some realtors there so there was some discussion on housing prices and availability primarily availability and highlighting the fact that that housing is a is an issue in the region as it is in many areas so i i don't have a sense of what that agenda is going to be at this point but it's once a week, I believe. It's every Wednesday, is it? I would first like to make a motion that uh, we uh, make Greg going to the Silver Sage a function of council, because that's a that's a good thing you're doing, Greg. Okay. All in favor of that, please indicate. That's carried. Uh, the other one. If someone has a motion to make, well, I think it could oh. be at the discretion of joint services at some level. Kelly, please. Do these agendas get circulated ahead of time? Could we decide based on the agenda? Let's, uh, I don't, I don't know anybody here has the answer to that right now. I'm going to suggest that we defer this for two weeks and let's get some more information and, and uh, somebody can talk to Mitch about it and, and get some good information with regard to how we want to handle it. And we'll leave that with joint services members, please. Is that acceptable? Okay, Greg, please. Yeah, I'll take care of that. I'll talk to Mitch and, and just get the, um, low down and maybe an agenda to what what happens at the meetings okay thank you are there any other requests for functions of council seeing none we'll move on municipal services business uh mr harpenter right. mark please well, good afternoon everyone um just to present the national public works week and requesting a proclamation from council uh, we have been doing this since 2014. Uh, this first arose when we got ourselves involved in uh, the American Public Works Association, which is uh, the, the Canadian Public Works Association is a, a sister parent company to the American Public Works. They don't actually have their own um, events or anything. They piggyback everything with the American group. We've been to uh, a few of the conferences and stuff. There's great benefit in this. And one of the best things is, of course, is that public education component about public works, what we do, why we do it, and, and how we support uh, the growth and, and whatnot in our communities. Uh, the 2022 National Public Works theme is ready and resilient. There's a little snippet there that uh, the American Public Works Association puts together every year. They have a number of, uh, they prepare a, a poster, they prepare a number of other things available for the week. And I guess a little bit of history for council. Uh, 
we we got the proclamation through council in 2014. In 2015, we also did that. And we also went to the extent in promoting ourselves in 2015 to inviting schools into uh, the county office here and touring them through our municipal uh, operations of public works. We had graders, we had plow trucks, we had gravel trucks, we had all those sorts of things. We put on uh, little meals for them and, and everything. And I think the food bank was, was participating in that to, to help us get the food together for them each day. Uh, they all got little safety vests and hard hats. They had a little exhibition to see how equipment operated down in their lower yard from a safe distance. Uh, it was actually quite great. And through that, we submitted uh, ourselves for uh, into the competition of National Public Works Week. So this was Canadian wide and we were awarded the first time entry award uh, for our publication. The Bizano School actually put together a video of our operations and whatnot that included interviews with staff and everything. And uh, that was part of the reasons why we beat out uh, a lo lot of other municipalities in Alberta with populations less than 10,000. Um, so as we've done in the past, uh, proclamation is in front of council. We'd encourage you to continue to support us in this endeavor. We don't have anything of any significant magnitude planned uh, whatsoever, whatsoever anymore. Uh, it's promoted across the week and uh, we will just continue with public education through social media posts, website, things like that to, to keep continue to keep the word getting out to our public. Thank you, Mark. Any questions or direction? Uh, Lynette, please. I'll make a motion that the County Council proclaim May 15th to the 21st as National Public Works Week. Okay, thank you. All in favor, please indicate. That's carried. Thank you for that, Mark. That will be my first declaration of that nature if I read this correctly. So. Committee reports. Uh, Amanda, you have a report uh, from Newell Housing Foundation, please. And I, it's, it's printed for us, so yeah. You can read it as printed. Yeah, okay, any questions? Appreciate that report, that's uh, good information for us to, to, to see. Um, Brooks? Parks and Recreation Board. Who is Mr. Greg, please? So we had our uh, meeting last night, and uh, just a couple highlights from the from the uh, Brooks and District Recreation Board. Um, they are having staff shortages at the pool uh, for um, various people, and it'd be mostly lifeguards and things like that. So they. They're, they're going through some issues there with, with staffing, just like everyone else is. And uh, they just said, if you know of anyone that's interested in becoming a lifeguard or is a lifeguard to, to uh, they have openings. Um, they, um, along with um, joint services, um, they have, uh, are putting a commitment for the 2023 Senior Alberta Summer Games. Um, and it was noted that Brooks and uh, Brooks and areas so that be Brooks and Newell will be hosting events uh, for that. So that's not until 2023. So they, they're putting the bid in. Um, if not, they're gonna. If they don't get that, they're gonna try again, maybe in 24 or 25. Um, so it's just a, a preliminary thing to promote the area. Um, nothing too major with the senior games. Uh, maybe slow pitch would be the most, and pickleball is a big one. I mean, if we have a new pickleball court, that would be pretty cool. Um, and uh, there's bridge and um, other things like that, including arts and crafts, which I didn't realize was an event, but it's gonna be, gonna be interesting, something for Neil. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, it, it'll it'll be good for the area and um, and one thing of note would be uh, these people mostly stay in campsites or camp bring their campers. So it's one note that uh, um, campground facilities would be a, a definite asset for this event. Um, other than that, uh, that's about it. Um, I did mention in, uh, to them that um, 
that the rodeo is a go. Uh, and uh, with uh, Silver Sage will be running it. So if there was any any items that uh, were part of the Brooks and area parks and rep facilities that that the rodeo and parade are are planning on being a goal. So. Thanks, Greg. Any questions? Uh, Dan, please. I missed that. What was that event with the arts and crafts? <laughs> was it? What was the event called? Arts, arts and crafts uh, <laughs> event. The whole thing. <laughs> the Alberta Seniors Summer Games. All right. You got to be 55 or older, which I will ah. be able to compete. I, I, I was thinking about the slow pitch team. Ten's almost enough for a team. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kelly, you've got a question? Just to add on to Greg's report, there is a possible $75,000 um, expense or um, contribution towards this event. So it's something for Matt and team to be aware of. Um, I think um, actually an expression of interest from this council is warranted. Thank you. Uh, what uh, form does that need to take? Just a motion to support and appro approve of the initiative to try to attract that event to Brooks and area at the County of Newell, right? Right. I, I would be uh, in favor of making that motion. Okay, thank you. We'll accept that. All in favor, please indicate. Oh, sorry, a question. Wouldn't that already been done previously from what you said, Greg, they've been talking about Newell and wasn't this all combined already or is this a, a thing that I'm kind of confused? Um, this is a, a a pretty new bid. We were approached by, well, the Alberta Summer Games, uh, the Senior Summer Games. Um, we've hosted the Alberta Southern Southern Games quite often. It's it's just one of those things that um, we bring to the area. This is new, so I don't think it would have been any, on any other prior budgets uh, that I know of anyway. Okay. All in favor of the motion to support this bid, please, uh, with, with moral support, I guess. That's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, other committee reports, the 911 committee. Who's giving that report? Neil, is that you? Yeah, I had the first meeting last night. As it turns out, 911 is a huge organization. The, the cost of 911 is $450 million. Uh, makes stars look kind of tiny. But uh, Stuart will have more to say about 911 in his report when he comes in to meet us. He was wondering if we wanted to bring the 911 director down to just give us the, the rundown. It's kind of interesting. It's they, They're not asking for anything, but it's a huge organization when you get into it. Yeah. So that was it. Does that cost national or, or? No, that's provincial. Yeah, everybody's connected. Stewart and Brooks and Red Deer. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's kind of amazing. Okay, thanks. Any questions for Neil on that? If not, would you give us the CWA update as well, please? Uh, that's just ongoing. They got their grant money, which you know. Yeah. Uh, they're just asking all local officials, that are any anybody, to get the fires burning under this and talk to our members, MLAs, MPs, fellow council members. Uh, we gotta gotta make this thing fly, and it's gonna take political will to do it now. So keep it in the back of your heads when it comes up in conversation. Give it a bump. Okay, thank you. No questions. We'll carry on. That takes us to post agenda items number 14, and there are two uh, that I've brought forward. One is the Bizano Health 
Centre Working Group, which we had talked about following our discussion with Minister Copping a number of weeks ago, that we would be interested to help provide leadership to that. And I think that was also in the context of the discussion I had with Bassano Mayor Irvin Morey. So I uh, took a call this week from John Slomp and Bassano asking that that we start getting things moving and I agreed that we would do that. We'd provide a, uh, a lead uh, for that and, and populate that working group with some people from council and I just suggested or um, am suggesting that it would be Amanda and Adina who are both on Newell Housing Foundation and probably Kelly uh, as the representative from the Bizano area and, and I've offered to help with that as well. So the four of us would attend that and and get uh, Matt to organize a meeting date together with Bassano. I expect that, uh, um, that uh, Newell Foundation uh, chairman, um, uh, who's your chairman, Adina and Amanda? Uh, Yoko, Yoko, yes, uh, we'll, we'll probably attend that as well as well as representatives from from Bizano Council so um, but I felt we needed to have that official we talked about it informally if that's if that's favorable to council I would suggest a motion that indicates uh, that we help set that up and who our representation would be then and the four of us if if you're favorable to that I think that's fine Neil yeah, I'll make that motion, but I have a question too. You're bringing together the three groups we were talking about before in this committee, right? Because when we first started talking about Bazano project, Bazano was pulling one way, the Housing Foundation was pulling another way, the old folks home wanted something else, AHS was on a different platform. Is this committee big enough? Like, to, can it do that? I think that's that's got to be the goal. The goal that, is that's to get the this mission thing. of the committee, right? Yeah, to it's, set to set up another committee. Yeah, it's or no, to, to no, bring those groups together. This is this is to bring everybody together and be a working group to to move this project forward. Okay. Is that how you yeah, understand it? I think we're on the same page. Yeah. I'll, I'll make that motion, and yeah, your okay committee choices are fine with me. Okay, um, all in favor of that, please indicate. That's carried. Uh, thank you. The other, uh, the other post agenda item relates to CDC South. Greg and I were on a tour of the greenhouses there a number of weeks ago, and we did have a discussion around the potential for this, the site at, uh, at our strategic planning session last week. Since then, uh, I've had a conversation with a number of people who were formerly employed there, the director indirectly, I didn't talk to him, but but to some other people who were a researcher who was involved there. And they have also initiated a conversation, trying to attract the Minister of Agriculture to come down and look at what's out here and what would the potential be to, to get something going here that has a local initiative and a local um, drive in the interest of also, as we've talked in other places, the ability to make decisions and get things going. There's there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure there that's just sitting idle. Um, anyway, in the context of that, I met with with a couple of people, Ron Geets and a, a, a former research there, researcher there, and they appreciated us helping to try to get, invite the minister to come out and try to raise the profile on that. I have sent a text to the um, minister Horner, and he suggested rightly that that we go through his scheduling assistant because of the complications of his schedule. So I will do that, but I'm thinking that it would probably also be a good idea to send a letter, a formal letter to the minister inviting him to come out and indicating our interest in seeing something happen there, whether it be, you know, I don't think we have the end game in mind other than some good ideas around applied research or something that has some drive and, and initiative from local stakeholders. So, but again, I think we need direction from council to be engaged in that at some level. Um, uh, and I think from the local group that has talked about this and, and has also had discussions with with bureaucrats in the, in the department at some level, 
they see the value and the need for a political um, activation on this thing. So I said I'd bring it to council and be prepared to sign off on a letter inviting the minister to come here and we'll also do what I can to encourage him to come. Uh, I think there's two things that, that are timely about it. I think there's some interest, not involving us, but some interest for some, from some people who would like to get some things going there for this growing season, so that's got to happen pretty quickly if it's going to. But then on a larger scale is, is the opportunity to, to cast a larger vision for the, for the site there. There's something like 700 acres of, of land there, some of it irrigated, some of it dry. Uh, the researchers just expressed a real potential for things to happen there that could be a benefit to farmers and, and uh, agriculture in the area. So just looking for direction to go ahead with that if we're okay with it. It is consistent, I think, with what our strategic planning discussion was, although it might be a little ahead of what we thought it might have might have been. So, Neil, you've got to... Yeah, I agree with that, only I think we should, uh, if you're going to get Nate down, let's get him for the day, because <laughs> we have other issues that we, like, we could, we could spend two, three hours with him, yeah. and if we're, I think he's an excellent ally, mm -hmm. and I know that he's interested in this area, so if we're going to get him down to do CDC, make a day out of it. He can give us a day a year, and I'm I'm sure you would. Sure, we could maybe so involve the EID at some level too for for some part of it. Once we got him here, let's put our cards on the table because we've got yeah. some pretty nice cards if they'll get on board with us. Yeah, I, I agree with you. So, uh, Dan, and then Greg, and then Holly. Is there any any way um, that the Medicinet College could be involved in this? Do they have any programs that could make use of those facilities? I think that uh, probably probably not at the outset, maybe, but I think I think that could be part of the vision that's cast for this thing, and I think or this facility, and I think that uh, um, in discussions with with Lethbridge College, they did indicate an, an interest or that they've begun talking to Medicine Hat College about some things that would be relative to the greenhouse, but it's a start. Yeah, uh, Greg. Yeah, they, they did mention um, talking with Medicine Hat. So, yeah, there's probably some um, initial talks about that. Uh, Medicine Hat's not really set up for horticulture, agriculture, uh, with their schooling. So uh, Lethbridge is definitely a better fit, but they also have that big research center down in Lethbridge area also. So um, now this CDC, is, is that provincial owned? It is, and it's possible that it's it's in the jurisdiction of infrastructure at this point because I think it's basically, I might be overstating, but I think it's mostly mothballed right now. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, there's some pretty high-tech equipment there, yeah. um, and I would think it would be in the government's best interest to, to get something going there and maybe um, diversifying that that area there's what close to 700 acres there yes that is not being utilized to its potential right now so so it's really important thank you excuse me go ahead Holly. yeah and agreeing with greg i don't think medicine at college has the capacity in the short term it would be, be at long term so but i'm i wanted to make a motion that we do send a letter to nate horner asking him to come down and uh um tour it with us and be involved in the initiative, like help yes. provide leadership at where it's needed, like facilitate, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please indicate. That's carried. Thank you. That takes us to item number 15, which is information items, which is all of item 15. So we're dangerously close to the end of this agenda. Um, any, any questions or comments on any of the information items uh, placed on our agenda? Holly, go ahead. Just curious about this Latham Solar Project connection. I they're just doing a connection, but is there actually a solar project there or is that supposed to be coming down the wire? This is new to me, so. Matt, do you know who has the answer to that? Uh, put me on the spot. I think that's the uh, Green Gate one that Amazon's going to be 
purchasing power off of. Uh, I'm seeing nods. Yeah, yeah. It, it's not built yet. It's yeah. That missed that Pam. What was that? Sorry, we've approved it as a development permit uh, at least last year. And Sandra said it's in the paper that they've uh, just had an extension for a year on it. Okay, good. Thank you. We're at the point where if someone made a motion that we go on camera, that's exactly what we do. Lynette, please. All in favor that we move to camera, in camera. That's carried, thank you. Okay, we will reconvene and move to item 8.2, bylaw 2031-22-22, the land use LUA 002. Maria, please. Thank you. Um, the purpose of this amending bylaw is to update the agriculture general district of our land use bylaw 2016-21 to prohibit specific uses in the plan area of the intermunicipal development plan with the village of Dutchess. On September 23rd, 2021, the County of Newell amended the land use bylaw 2016-21 to remove the fringe district and subsume it with the agriculture general district. New land uses were added to this agriculture general district. The Village of Dutchess filed a Notice of Appeal to the Land and Property Rights Tribunal raising concerns, amongst other things, about land uses which it said were previously not authorized in the Fringe District. These uses include feed mills, grain mills, abattoirs, and hydrous ammonia storage, fertilizer plants, hotel motels, pit or quarry, campgrounds, recreation outdoors, specifically go-kart tracks, paintball and theme parks, schools, large solar installations and wind farms, and tiny homes uh, and park models. So in order to address concerns raised by the village, county administration proposes exempting, proposes exempting the following land uses in the agriculture general district, only within the plan area of the intermunicipal development plan with the village of Dutchess. So these uses would include agriculture processing, which would include feed mills and grain mills, agriculture regulated, which includes abattoirs and hydrous ammonia storage and fertilizer plants, campgrounds, recreation outdoor, small wind energy systems, free standing solar panels greater than 56 square meters and tiny homes and park models. Um, Prior to the village of Dutchess filing their appeal, administration um, it had also already, and council had already um, made pit or quarry as a discretionary use in the agriculture general district. Um, but there is an extra exemption section which prohibits, um, or, sorry, that provides that pit or quarry should not be located within the IDP area of the city of Brooks, the town of Bizano, the village of Dutchess, and the village of Rosemary. And hotel, motel, and schools were never listed as discretionary or permitted um, as a use in the agriculture general district. So those would not uh, be allowed to be developed within that area. So administration is recommending that council give first reading to bylaw 2031-22 to amend section 5 a gen agriculture general land use district of bylaw 2016-21 as indicated in the attached schedule a to prohibit these specific uses within the plan area of the intermunicipal development plan within the village of Dutchess. Thanks. Thank you, Maria. Are there any questions or prepared for the motion? Holly, go ahead. I'd like to make that motion. Okay. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion, please indicate. That's carried. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeff and Maria. Um, pardon me. Um, I think, I think there's only one other thing that we need to discuss that was brought to my attention, item 15.4, 
let's have a brief discussion around the RMA member visit that's going to happen on May the 5th, which is our next meeting date. Uh, Matt, what do we need to decide about that? Um, well, the uh, RMA folks have sent uh, an email and they have a few questions for us. Uh, what are your top three advocacy priorities? And we have a nice handy dandy advocacy list coming out of your strategic retreat. So, I mean, you could pick your favorite three if you have a favorite. Um, uh, they say they're interested in profiling members in an increased fashion. Are there any innovative projects or unique approaches to an issue your municipality has taken? Um, I could survey staff and have them surface some of that information and we can circulate that to uh, council. By all means, if you observed something you consider particularly innovative, uh, put it on the plate. And then they're curious, how can the RMA serve you better both from the business service side or advocacy perspective. So a um, few items, food for thought there. Anyone have any suggestions? I think one of the things we want to highlight to them as, as we've discussed earlier is water and the importance water plays in our region. Uh, we're planning just to meet on site here or are we, are we going to do any kind of a drive around at all. How much time do we have with them again? Just that three hours? It's gonna to be tough to organize a drive around and within that time frame. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know what we'd look, I mean, maybe a drive out to the lake is about and, and back, but that's not gonna take much time. And, Maybe that's not of much value either. I don't know. Or Neil, uh, oh, we got uh, Sewa on our our list. It's the first item on the list. Right, that's good. Like we need RMA to get behind this to represent our counties because they yeah. represent quite a few counties that are involved in this. Mm -hmm. If they'd make a resolution, that would that would really start to lift a little bit. Do you think? I'm not sure if you'll get a resolution for a regional kind of issue. You might get a resolution for, you know, energy from waste facilities as a general kind of a thing, but something Whatever. to chew on. It all works. I mean, they, they've asked about advocacy. I mean, I think advocacy is, is one of the big things, and they know that. I mean, so they're doing that. But I, I, I mean, I, I can't off the cuff think of anything that would increase the value of that other than to continue to fly that up the flagpole in terms of figuring finding ways to influence this government and, and future governments on behalf of rural alberta Dan? Yeah, maybe one of the things we can try to get them to help us advocate for is is more of that red tape reduction when it comes to the parks around here because we just today Another issue came up, and, and I'm hearing more things happening all the time. Maybe if we can, yeah, get them to help us with that, figuring out where, who, who, would do, who do we need to talk to to get that stuff running properly again? We got a lot of parks to bring in a lot to this area. UNESCO World Heritage Site, that's, there's issues out there. But. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, Neil. Uh, when Jason shows up here, would it be out of line to ask him some questions on his county's experience with solar? That's a good idea. Well, no, but he's here as an RMA rep. Yeah, but if that's one and of his questions. He, he's got a really good story to tell. Well, he's probably the guy that would tell it for that group, right? So I, I don't see a problem with that, really. I mean, it's... It's really, I don't know, it's not really RMA, but... No. I wouldn't want to take away from our chance to sell our county as opposed to listening to them give information if we have things you want to talk about and I don't know. It depends much what to talk about. And I guess if Paul is so talkative, I don't know how much time there will be for the back and forth. I yeah, I, I like do we do are we gonna make a formal presentation with uh, not much, are we? 
I mean, we can, uh, sky's the limit, right? Um, if we want uh, a formal presentation, you know, staff can certainly put, put something together, whether it's, you know, outline of, of SEWA, uh, high level look at that, um, red tape reduction and red tape reduction backfiring uh, in our experience. Um, whether you request a, a presentation from uh, Reeve Schneider on, on the solar, we could put that out there if that's what uh, council wants to do. I think it's uh, structured as a more informal visit uh, unless, like, I would suggest we probably do it in the breakout room to keep it a little more casual yeah. with, with the guys, right? Um. I suggest, if I may, that we um, advise of our rural water project and that we're going into phase two. They, they wouldn't know that unless we highlight that. And the other thing is our so soil erosion policy. That's unique to our county. And I think um, it may be of interest. Thanks, Kelly. Anything else? Uh, Greg. Uh, are they just a provincial lobby or is that, are they federal also? I'm just wondering if we can lobby them uh, for the update to the rules with respect to uh, temporary foreign workers because labor is a big problem. Um, and if we can get those temporary foreign workers back into our country, that would be a, a real positive thing for us. So I don't know if they, they can do any lobbying with respect to that or not. I don't know. Okay, I think it's a conversation we could have. Oh, Matt, did you have content and then Matt? I, I was just going to say maybe we could ask uh, uh, Paul and the crew to highlight for our relatively new council some of the avenues for, for advocacy, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, any advice they have to uh, make our efforts more efficient. And, yeah. That's, that's a good idea, I think. Ask them to present. I was gonna say, I think that's more uh, of an FCM thing. Yeah. Um, RMA does our provincial advocacy and FCM does our federal ad advocacy. But, but RMA has, a, has representation on FCM as well, so yeah. And there is a provincial nominee program as part of the foreign worker thing. So there is that piece to it, which maybe we could access in a better way than what we're doing. Okay, anything else, uh, Matt? Well, maybe just to, uh, to wrap that conversation up, uh, I'd propose that uh, staff, we can prepare like a, whether it's a PowerPoint or whatever, just a one pager for each, each of those items, SEWA, red tape reduction, uh, rural water, soil erosion, temporary foreign worker advocacy kind of a thing to guide, guide the conversation. Uh, we can circulate that. What's solar? Uh, yeah, but if we want to request that from, from uh, Reeve Schneider, I think he's got it on his radar because uh, he was ambushed at Halo. <laughs> so if that works, okay. then we'll, we'll circulate that prior to the meeting and, you know, let you have a kick at the draft. And if Sounds there's good. other things that come out, we can, can add to We're it. Gonna have a pretty good lunch. Steak sandwiches. Define, that, yeah, what do you guys want for lunch? We can... Uh, I think a steak. Can we, we, can, we, can, we can get a steak. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll arrange that. Don't you think? I think so. Broth and uh, rolls. Grass fit steak. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to look back. We'll, yeah, we'll kick we'll, that out. We'll I thought there was maybe an invite in the uh, okay. calendars. Okay, good enough. Um, 20 after three, if somebody makes a motion, I think we'll adjourn. Okay, the meeting was adjourned at 20 after three. Thank you, I think we did not too bad for a pretty big agenda today. Thank you. Took a little longer at the end here, but that's okay.